Cash Flow Diary Podcast, episode 353. Welcome to yet another exciting episode of the Cash Flow Diary Podcast. The podcast that teaches you insider tips, tactics, and strategies for creating leverage streams of cash flow into your life. Learn from top performing entrepreneurs, business owners, investors, and thought leaders from across the globe as they share their secrets to success. Like what you learn on this and other Cash Flow Diary podcast episodes? Go to learninvestingnow.com and sign up to receive powerful tips and information that will help you succeed as an entrepreneur and investor. Now, here's your host, investor, entrepreneur, business owner, educator, speaker, author, and master facilitator of Robert Kiyosaki's cash flow game, Jay Massey. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the Cashflow Diary Podcast. I am your host, Jay Massey, and I'm glad that you're here today because you and I, well, have you ever noticed that some people seem to get more done in a day than others? But have you ever thought about the fact that everybody, meaning you, me, everyone, we only have 24 hours. No one gets more hours in a day, yet some people seem to get more done. In a day. Now, if you've ever said to yourself, this is the year I'm going to get organized and make more money and get more done, well, I have with me today a gentleman who can help you make that happen finally. So, what does that mean? That means I think this is going to be one of those episodes where you're going to not only replay it, but you're going to want to take notes and you're going to want to underline and highlight and definitely be ready to move at the speed of instruction because we are going to make sure together that you get more accomplished this year than you ever have before. I have with me none other than Bob Posen. He's been a president of Fidelity. Fidelity, yes, that company. I know you've heard of them, okay? So, but let me ask you, let me also underscore a couple of other things. Senior official at both state and federal government levels. He is uh, been a lecturer at MIT Sloan School of Management. Here's my point. You don't get to the top of those organizations. You don't manage anything for long without learning how to be productive. And what's really cool for you and I is that he's written the the book about it. What does that mean? Extreme productivity, boost your results, reduce your hours. He says it's only a two to three hour read, but here's the cool thing. It's been translated into 10 different languages. So if you think you're the only one who needs this help, you're wrong. Because 10 different languages means a lot of people need the information that's coming to you today just for listening to the podcast. So help me welcome none other than Bob Posen. Bob, you there? I am there. I'm here. (laughs) I'm everywhere. I like it. I like it. I like it a lot. Thank you for taking the time to be here. So now, this being your first time here, I have to ask you the same question I ask everybody the first time that they're here. Are you ready? I am ready. All right. So I tend to look at today's entrepreneurs a lot like yesterday's superheroes. You know, Batman, Robin, Wonder Woman, Hulk, etc. And I think entrepreneurs and superheroes have a ton of things in common. Chief among them, we use our special skills and abilities to go out there and hopefully make other people's lives easier with our products and services. Now, occasionally, yes, we get dressed up in tights and masks and whatnot, but you get the idea. I also believe, just like superheroes entrepreneurs, well, we have an origin story. We have a beginning. I mean, if you think about Spider-Man, for example, before he was Spider-Man, he was out there, just a kid, going to school, maybe taking some photos for the newspaper, trying to make ends meet. Then something happens to him. He has to make a choice and then choose to use his unique ability for good or evil. So my question to you, sir, is before being a senior official at the state and federal government levels, before being the president of Fidelity Investments, before being, you know, lecturing in the books and all the things that you are currently known for, my my question to you is, who is Bob Posen? Well, Bob Posen's a guy who grew up in Bridgeport, Connecticut, in a family that didn't have a lot of money, so I started working two jobs when I was in high school and I worked my way through college and through graduate school. So I never really thought a lot about being productive until later when I wrote this book. But in effect, I was forced to be productive because I had to get through school, earn some money, do all these other things. And, uh, you know, that's who I am. And in the process, 
I tried to uh, have high ideals, high goals, be able to motivate people to really accomplish something that they would feel good about. And uh, at the same time, um, you know, uh, be able to get some progress on public policy issues, not just on business. And I think business people can feel very good if they're successful at business, but I want them also to feel that the government is doing the right stuff uh, in uh, dealing with the most important public policies like social security or retirement and these sorts of things. Well, it's, it's, it's interesting that you work in the area of productivity and then you mentioned government because for some, those two words don't seem to go together. You know, well, I think it, it, it's definitely a challenge in certain governments and in certain bureaucracies, government bureaucracies that are very large and where people have a sort of a very robotic view. But I was lucky enough to be uh, an official of the SEC, which is a pretty small agency, very focused on its mission of enforcing the securities laws. And a lot of people go to the SEC, they stay there for four or five years, and then they go to the private sector. So it's not one of these places where people have been in the government for 30 or 40 years. So there are parts of the government that are very productive, and the SEC is one of them. <laughs> okay, this is awesome. All right, so let, let's take take us through the journey. Like, how does one, I mean, in, in my estimation, in, in the years that I've been around, very few of us just wake up hyper productive individuals are born, quote unquote, that way. So what was the journey from, you know, high school to realizing, hey, I got to, you know, find a system or a way to to process my day and minutes are special and precious and making sure that I can get the most out of every hour that I've been given and gifted. Well, as I said, you know, if you're working a few jobs and, you know, I was on scholarship at Harvard, so you know, there are some pretty smart people there. So you got to be on your toes. So it takes a lot to do all those things. So you get used to that. And then when you get into business and you get promoted and you're running a large business, um, uh, you, you then realize that you've got to be able to pick the right people to delegate, have a much different concept of productivity. And in the end, uh, I wrote a piece for the Harvard Business Review and I handed it in to the editor, and the editor said to me, you're the only person who hands in their articles on time and within the word limit. <laughs> and it appears at the time that you're teaching a full load at a top business school. And at that time, I was also executive chairman of a $300 billion asset manager. And he says, we want to know what your secret juice is. <laughs> right. Gave this interview and it went viral. And that's how I came to write the book. I never thought of myself as a productivity expert. I thought of myself as a person who just tried to get a lot done in whatever area I was working. And then I realized through this interview and the reaction to it that there was a hunger among a lot of people uh, to uh, – really figure out what are the basic principles here and how can I improve my own productivity? So that's what I did. Yeah, that I mean, that's amazing. I mean, it, it, I think it's often uh, for the, that superhero slash entrepreneur's journey where we, we don't realize what magic sauce we might actually have until someone else comes and tells us, hey, no, 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 that was that's special. You don't understand that everybody can do what you do, and we may take it for granted, not even understanding, you know, that that it's something like that. So I guess my my question then becomes, when it comes down to being productive, you know, uh, you know, every at the beginning, at the top of every year, many of us make that decision, you know, what I mean, get more done, I'm like, be organized, I'm a, I'm gonna finally make it happen. But yet, for many, quote, unquote, life, kids, soccer, something d distracts from these new goals. And suddenly, you know, we find ourselves two months later, just back in the same old rut and still feeling like there's not enough time. What would you say is the best way to begin that process? I mean, th this is an entire transformation you're talking about. 
Well, I think the, the way to begin is to start really forcing yourself to articulate and put down in writing what your priorities are, both personal and professional. And uh, that gives you a chance to focus. But the problem is that when most people do that, it's very abstract and it's sort of like, well, next year I'm going to do this. So what I've uh, proposed, and I actually have uh, a notebook that I've put out that's uh, put out by the Wall Street Journal now uh, that's that sort of says, let's take your your diary, your your sort of uh, daily schedule and let's reformulate it. Let's not just put down, you know, all your appointments, all your meetings, et cetera. Let's have the page divided in two. On the left side, let's put down your appointments, your meetings, all this stuff. But on the right side, I want you to put down what you want to get out of this. Most people mm-hmm. go through the day mm-hmm. essentially responding to other people's requests, to other people's demands. At the end of the day, they come home and they say to their spouse, I've worked really hard, but I don't know exactly what I've accomplished. And the reason <laughs> is because they're not accomplishing what they're trying to do. There, there is basically following directions from others. So that's the first thing you need to do is to really integrate what you think are the biggest priorities for you into your daily schedule. Got it. Got it. Got it. So now there's a lot of people listening and myself, I'm going to put myself into this category, uh, sir. I am the quintessential fire, fire, aim, fire again then aim, then get ready and fire one more time kind of guy. That that That's just kind of, I'm, that's what I default to. I default to moving forward. I, and, and what it sounds like is you're saying is, you know, stop and plan a little bit first. <laughs> yeah, no, in fact, I would urge people the night before to, to, to go over their schedule for the next day and to see what's on it and what they want to hope to get out of it by the end of the day. The other thing that I strongly advocate is if you're working with groups, and I'm sure a lot of people uh, on listening to you are managers of group, you have to do more than just say to the group, I want to get this done or want to get that done. You've really got to get to the group to agree on what I call the metrics for success. That is, if you say, say you're in a company and you say, well, what we need to do is to improve customer service. Well, who's against improving customer service? Almost nobody. But if you then think about, well, how are we going to know in a month whether we've done that or not? Well, there are lots of different ways you can think about that. Mm -hmm. You can think about that by answering the phone faster, uh, reducing the number of mistakes. You can think about that as going out and seeing clients. So you got to get away from these general abstract notions and get really uh, to the discipline of creating success metrics. Those make very concrete what you need to aim for. And then people will know at the end of whatever the time period is, week, a month, three months, they'll know whether they've actually been successful. So if you're running around like a crazy man, that's not going to help. You got to focus on the metrics. My uh, great, uh, my understanding and my research has all said the same thing. I got to get people away from these broad and somewhat platitudinous objectives. And you, the way you do that is by saying, how are we going to know whether we've succeeded? Those force you to be much more specific. Got it. Got it. Now, you, there are two things you said here, and I want to dig in on one of them first, because and you just said the night before, like the night before work on the next day. And I'm just like, hold on, that that's really near term. You're not talking like trying to plan out my, you know, months or years ahead of time. You're oh, just saying I, that- I, yeah, I, I guess I would say first you start off by having yearly goals. And yearly metrics. But then those, for a lot of people, they're too broad, they're too abstract. I want you every week to sit down and say, this is my schedule for the coming week. This is what I hope to accomplish. And then 
as each day goes by to see what you've accomplished and check it off and what you have to do for the next day and really work through that on a day-to-day basis. Got so it. I agree, you can't start on a day-to-day basis, but you have to translate those general, it's so easy to say, oh yeah, I'm going to be more organized or <laughs> I'm going to time with my kids or I'm going to, you know, sort of uh, write three articles or I'm going to, you know, finish, finally finish my PhD thesis, you know, but you got to translate that into much more specific steps. Okay. So let's talk about that for a second, because you said specifically when working, working with the group, but I also hear, it sounds like if you, if the group is a group of one, meaning just ourselves, uh, those metrics are still important. Who gets to define what the metrics are? Well, if you're dealing just with yourself, obviously you do, but I also deal in my book in several chapters with managing and leading groups because to be productive in a lot of situations, you can't just be a lone ranger. You've got to get people to work together and to uh, hopefully uh, produce more as a group than they would as individuals. So if you're the manager of a group, let's say you're a manager of a group of 10 people, you as the manager have the right to set the general objectives because you're tied into uh, what the whole organization wants to do and where this whole strategy is going. But you can't set the metrics yourself because if you do, first of all, the group won't really uh, accept them. And second of all, they may have different, very different ideas. So that's why I like to say, if you're a manager of a group, after you set these broad objectives and say, we need to improve customer service over the next month, then you say to the group, how are we going to know whether we as a group have achieved this general goal. And let's together agree on metrics. So that does several things. One is it brings the group together. So there's now a consensus as to what we mean by these big terms. And second of all, these people feel they're not being ordered around. They feel like they, I call it, own their own space. They, they, they are motivated because they've, they've picked what they think are the, are, are the right metrics. And third of all, it it moves you away from just counting the number of hours you put in and see whether you're actually achieving those metrics. And that's what we want people to do. We want people to focus on achieving the metrics, not just staying in the office more hours or typing harder or this or this. We want them to actually focus on accomplishing what we've agreed are the goals and the success metrics that measure them. Okay. So even when it comes down to the definition of what, you know, metrics we're going to use to measure success, you're saying that that's a part of the group decision as well? Absolutely. Okay. Because there, there's, I mean, the, the leader has to set bounds so people couldn't come up with crazy ideas, but people, people have very different uh, views as to what this is, how to go, how to go about it. Any general goal you have for a group. And if you're a manager, the key is delegation. If you want to be a productive person, you can't do everything yourself. And probably the thing that I see as the biggest efficiency in new managers, new CEOs, new leaders, they try to keep doing everything themselves. And they wind up doing 10 things, 20 things, as opposed to delegating to them to groups. And if you're going to delegate, then you've got to get into this process of setting objectives and agreeing on metrics. And if you want the group to carry out your objectives, you can't just say, do this, do that. In today's uh, workforce, people won't buy that. Well, okay, you're bringing up something that's (laughs) kind of sensitive for nearly every entrepreneur listening or would-be entrepreneur, because when confronted with this, there's often the, well, but, you know, I can do it cheaper. I can do it myself. Why do I need to delegate it? Well, it all depends on how much you want to do, you know, like what usually happens is the entrepreneur starts off with a fairly small company and a volume and everything. But then as it grows, many of these people try to say, okay, I'll just do more and more and more. And then they wind up staying up all night and doing all this stuff and the quality goes down and at some point they crash. And everyone knows that there's a big difference between a successful entrepreneur and somebody who's successful at building a large organization. And that's the transition that I'm talking about. And, you know, if 
you know, I've seen new CEOs say, okay, here are the three most important uh, 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 goals that we have for this organization. Let's see who should do it. Well, here's goal number one. I'm the best at doing that, so I ought to do that. Goal number two, I'm the best at doing that. I ought to do that. <laughs> and goal number three, I ought to do that. So, I mean, but then they set a real limit on how big that organization is going to be. Well, and that's exactly what I was getting to say when you were talking about, you know, a large organization. I don't think it has to be that large. I mean, even if the organization is just three people. No, I agree. If you have an organization that's, that has three people and you want to expand it to six or seven, then you've got to figure out how to manage and how to set objectives and how to get metrics. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to go from three to seven. You're just going to try to have those three people do more and more until they break down. Yeah, I can relate to that one. Um, so let me <laughs> let me ask this because this is also something that I've 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 done myself and I've seen happen where you know I can go through all this planning, right? And I you know when when I do when someone actually convinces me to stop long enough to try to put together a strategy, here's what I've always seen: no matter how long I plan, how well I plan, no matter how much thought I feel like I, I, we've put into it, no matter what happens. The moment we begin execution, it feels like everything changes. So at the same time, it's like, why why bother planning? It's all going to change anyway. What would you well, say to those of us who feel that way? Well, I think you're perhaps planning in the wrong way. So I talk. In oh, this my... is good. Keep going. I want to plan the right way. I, I, I mean, <laughs> help me, please. <laughs> Cause... How do you do relatively large projects? So. A lot of people do what you do. They sit down, they try to think about it, they come up with a strategy, they go and do all this research, they gather this data, everything, it all gets mushed together, and then they hopefully try to synthesize it, you know, a month later or two months later. So my idea of doing big projects is just the opposite. I think, like, when I have people who are working with me do large projects, and by a large project, I mean, like, Let's decide on having a, you know, where we're going to place a new factory or what's, let's decide which uh, new product we're going to launch or something like that. I want them to spend two days really researching that and really thinking about that and then to come up with, from a bottoms up point of view, to come up with critical factors or preliminary conclusions, these sorts of things that will say, well, on the basis of these two days, I now think we ought to go in this direction, but there's that alternative, etc. And the idea is not to reach a final conclusion and not to think you're going to do that, but to have a process. And so you start with that, and then it, let's assume it's a four-week project. At the end of every week, you sit down and say, well, let's see how much more I've learned, and let's see if we can't change these things and conclusions and really force ourselves to, to, to bring it forward. So by the time you get to the end of the month, you've really gone through this process several times. And it's just much, much more effective. Why? Well, first of all, it's what I, it's a bottoms up process. You're not trying to just sit there and philosophize and think in your mind. <laughs> it's an empirical process by which you're trying various things out and seeing whether they want, they work or not. Second of all, it's an iterative process, meaning that you're 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 trying things out, and you're you know from the very beginning that you're going to change them. You're going to change these things. And third of all, it, the, this process forces you to focus on what are the critical variables and what are the critical facts. Otherwise, a lot of people they start off, they think about stuff, they get three weeks down, and they realize that they haven't really focused on the critical facts or the critical variables because they've been running so hard. And so this is a very different way to go about a process uh, and a much more successful way. You know, what I'm what I'm hearing is that it fundamentally, while it it feels, at least to me, I'm I'm someone who scores high in, you know, in in on the Colby with quick start and in any sort of moving thing that that's just clearly where I come from, but it just sounds like you, you're you just trying to be more 
purposeful with the direction of the energy or limited resources that that may be present. So instead of having to <laughs> uh, do it over uh, or, ref- you know, start, you're just trying to catch things before they happen or you're just trying to move so that it's successful the first time. That's is that is that close to the idea? Or, I mean, I don't understand. I think that's partly right. But I'm also trying to say that you shouldn't expect them. You shouldn't expect this process to be successful in the first uh, iteration. What you need to do is realize that any project that's fairly big, it's going to take a number of different steps to get there. So what you want to do is let's get the quick start and try to learn as much as we can, but let's set things up so that we systematically revise what we're doing every week. We systematically learn from these things. Mm -hmm. And so we don't expect to get the answer in the first step. We expect to set up a process by which we gradually move towards synthesis. But we don't get there right away, and we never expect to get there. See, a lot of people who are the quick starts figure, well, here, I got the answer. We're going to run with it. I'm just the opposite. I say, yes, you should try to think about whatever strategic considerations and do the best you can. But you got to realize that no matter how well you think through things in advance, when things actually start to move, they're going to be different and yeah. you're going to huge amount. So you want to you want to structure the process so that you learn at each step and don't assume that you've got it all right at the beginning. Yeah, That's okay. the difference. Well, okay. So there's two things then that comes up for me as I'm listening to you. One, there's the proverbial, okay, I'm going to, you know, philosophize and think before I take action. And that can be an endless cycle before you actually start moving. And then there's the, uh, I'm not going to start moving until I can understand and see the entire process. Because, and both of those drive me nuts. So help me out. (laughs) Yes, nuts. I try not to go nuts too frequently, but here's the thing. There's a part of time to plan. There's a time to just take action. But most importantly, you may have even heard once or twice that everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face. Well, it is what it is. Here's the point. You got to be open to the destination, but yet don't get sold on one particular pathway to get there. Here's my point with that. Cash flow, it's changing in the real estate world, and it's going in many different places. You need to stay on top of it. One of the new places that we've found is short-term rentals. As you may know, if you're following us on Periscope or in Facebook Live, we've been talking about it a lot. And what's been really interesting is the results that many people have been able to generate. So if you want to be one of those people or if you want to know what's going on in the short-term rental game, go over to cashflowdiary.com forward slash coming soon. Again, that's cashflowdiary.com forward slash coming soon because coming soon to a computer near you is some training related to short-term rentals. Anyway, let's get back to the rest of the story. I'm against that. I'm saying, you, you, you well, it depends on how you define the entire process. I'm saying... First of all, you, you in the first part, you don't philosophize forever. You don't procrastinate forever. You break things up into parts and you start with as much information as and as much thinking as you could reasonably do. But second of all, you but, but, then, but hold on, hold on. How do you know when that is? How, do, how does one know when that is? How does someone who's stuck in that cycle go, OK, now this is enough and I just need to be OK with that and move forward? Two days. OK. A lot of two days, people always tell me they can't do this because they don't know, know anything about this area. If you spend two days researching and thinking about something, you'll have some preliminary ideas as to what the answers are. May not be right, may be in certain various directions. And then you've got to set things up so that you assume that you're going to learn as you go forward and you're going to revise your conclusions, your directions each week. Okay, I like it. I like it. And then what about the the person who doesn't want to move until they can see the entire process? And by that, I mean, uh, there's a number of people that I work with who they won't write, they won't even write the the offer for, say, their first property or begin their ideas for their business until they can see completely 
and and how they're going to get to and I'm just going to be ridiculous for a moment and say their first six figures or eight seven figures they they won't even get started so that they can begin that refining well, process. They're, they're being very naive and very unrealistic. Everyone who's ever run a business or started a new organization or been an entrepreneur understands that you can try to identify the critical factors. You can try to see the past, but once you get out in the real world things are going to change so that if you wait till you have that full path, well, you probably will procrastinate for, for months and maybe even years. So the key is, and, and I deal with procrastination in the book because I think the perfectionist hmm. is the procrastinator. And I'm saying, don't do that. <laughs> I get it. Yeah. Get your business plan and then realize that it's going to get changed. And, and set up the process so that you can systematically revise it and learn as you try out various things. That's the way you get success. I mean, I've developed a lot of new financial products in my life. And, you know, some of them look great when we started and were flubs. Others, you know, were barely, you know, ready to try out and turned out to be huge successes. You just it, there's a limit to how much you can figure out in advance. Yeah, yeah. So then I, I guess let me let me ask this question for someone who might be thinking it. Has there ever been a time where you you what you planned is exactly what happened? <laughs> like would almost almost never. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I didn't I didn't think so. I, I didn't think so. That's accepting accepting the process, accepting the reality and 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 taking advantage of it. That's the that's the key. I call this uh, sometimes, you know, start at the end, meaning, you know, get as far as you can, but then set up the process, compartmentalize it and get into that. And uh, the the reality is that uh, no matter how good your strategy is, you're going to change it. Uh, and there are just so many examples of people who, who radically change it. But even if you're not radically changing your strategy, you're you're really modifying it intelligently and and understanding that until you get out there in the field and get out there with clients and get out there with products, you you only know a limited amount about what's going to happen. Yeah. So let me ask you this then. What would um, I mean, you've worked with a lot of people. This is not a subject that's new to you. What would. What would be if I asked you like the top three things that rob the average American or person or entrepreneur of their ability to be productive? What's what's in the way? Well, I think we started to talk about so one of them that's in the way is procrastination. And I believe that uh, every almost everyone is a procrastinator to a greater or lesser degree, meaning when they get to a hard part. They don't want to do it. They sort of uh, shy away from it. It's too big. It's too mammoth. So you've got to break the problem in parts, start off with a relatively easy part and start to get going. Uh, and some people need deadlines. Well, divide the project into a lot of parts and pick up those. I'd say a, a second problem that uh, I see characteristically is uh, that people get overwhelmed with their own email, overwhelmed with the amount of information. Oh, man. Yes. Because, I mean, email is a, a great tool for productivity, but it's also like you see people who are like looking at their email every two minutes. Like basically that's what they do in life is look at their email. And what do they do? They try to look at everything. And so, I have a several step approach to email. First is try not to look at it all the time. Try to look at it every hour or two and try to keep yourself from doing that because it's addictive. We all know it's addictive. Uh, second of all, when you look at your email, you should try to skip over 60 to 80 percent just by looking at the subject matter or the sender, because most of what you get is trash or should be trash. It's not worth reading. And then the third point I have is when you get some email that's important, don't put it in some holding pattern. Don't say, oh, 
I'll get to this in a few days because before you know it, you'll have 200 important emails that are uh, tucked away in some hibernating facility. <laughs> you know, there are only two things can happen. One is you'll f- forget about it entirely. And then, you know, the email from the IRS, they'll come and possess your car. So that's not very good. The other thing is in a week, you'll remember, hey, I had this email that I was supposed to uh, send back this information to an important client or my boss or something. And then when you do it, you'll spend another half an hour trying to find it. And then when you send it to that person, they'll be ticked off that you took a week to do it. So I have this principle, I call it Ohio, only handle it once. And I see. That's when you have an important email, only handle it once, right then and there. Answer it and you'll, you'll, you, you won't worry, you won't spend any energy about whether you've answered all this stuff. And the person on the other side who's an important person to you will feel good about it. Yeah, so, I I wish my inbox only had 200 important emails in it. That would be progress. Oh, uh, I bet you your email doesn't have 200 important emails in it. I bet you just haven't been tough enough with what's an important email. Ah, I like that. I like that. Well, email is by far the worst way to communicate with me. I have been known to go two or three days without looking at it uh, because I just don't want to look at it. That that's for sure. So let me ask for for those that are like me. But you could you could you could you could. What you need to do is set up a filtration system. So there are certain people <laughs> yeah. like your spouse or your boss that or the IRS that you really should answer if you get emails. So you gotta you gotta be able to highlight those. You get, and certain subjects in this. So you got to filtrate them so that, you know, more than half of your email never gets to you. It just gets into the spam box. And that's where it should be. One way to do it is think about all the emails that come to you automatically, mm. I mean, you know, from some politician who wants to raise money <laughs> or right. some charity that you never heard of. Right, right. right welcoming you to their ninth gala that you don't even know what they're talking about. So, or some commercial thing that's trying to sell you, you know, uh, a super bunny or, you know, some <laughs> type of lubricant oil for your car. And you don't even know what the hell it's about. Yeah. So I view as anybody who sends me an email by automation. I don't want to see it. I did. It's out. You know, totally. so you can set up filtration systems so that you don't even get, you know, you get less than half your emails and then you got to get tough with yourself as to, you know, who's it from and what's the subject matter. And uh, I'd say I basically answer about a third of my emails, you know, something like that. Yeah. I mean, they get answered. They just get answered by other people because it's too much time. So which gets me to my point or the question I was going to ask is, you know, when it comes down to what you're talking about, a lot of what you're talking about, it actually, to me, when I hear it, it just sounds like more work to do. (laughs) That's really what it sounds like. Because the reason, look, when you look at your emails, um, for somebody like you, you would say, well, here's a whole set of emails that come from people who are, I don't know, maybe part of a fan club or this or that. And it's really not necessary for me to answer them. So that's a delegation issue. So you ought to be able to say, you ought to have someone go through your email and be able to, to sort out every day, take out saying, here are all these things that Jay doesn't need to touch. And here are a few things that he does need to do. So, and that's a really good role for an administrative assistant. Full-time job right there, managing my email, I promise. Um. <laughs> but, 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 but that's worth it because if you're not answering your email for several days, yeah, I get you. You're ticking off a lot of people who might actually, you know, there are a lot of people who you don't care about because you don't even know them or this, but there are 25 or 30% of those people who you really would choose if you chose not to tick them off. Yeah, and I get that, and that that was our that was my thought process behind setting up the emails because the ones that are public, the email addresses that are public, they're going to somebody. They're just not coming directly to me all the time because I can't handle those, uh, right. which is great. So that those people do feel taken care of. 
it, it just it what you're talking about just feels and it, all of this just when every time I I hear this topic, I mean, I like the idea of it. It's just like, man, how does that happen? But at on the other end, if it when it's not connected to like a dollar amount, like if I got my email under control, I could make an extra two hundred grand this year. You know, if someone said that, I'd be like all over it. I'm like, okay, cool. That that would be wonderful, but. It, it's really hard for me to get excited about these things when I don't have, like you were talking about earlier, some sort of metric, some sort of KPI, some sort of ROI associated with it. So how how would you m- measure that to go, yeah, this was, it was worthwhile going to organize my email? Well, I think one of the things is how many important opportunities did you miss because she didn't read it? All right, you win. <laughs> and but but i think in your situation you know your 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 uh radio personality it's a different uh that you you need to have a, a, a private email where the people who count are sending it to you and even then it needs to be filtered by someone who can help you figure out what are the relatively few number of emails that you need to to answer so if you do that you should you have the right administrative assistant you'd have a situation where you'd be doing email one hour a day and you'd focus on the people who are really important and those people you know you they're going to create opportunities for you and uh, they can also create problems for you no so doubt no doubt that's worth it so there's one more thing I want to talk about be- before we end, and it's the idea because occasionally I hear, like, I-, I know one of my coaching clients, he he said this to me maybe last week. He was like, you know, um, Jay, I- I- I've spent five months working on this, and it- nothing has happened yet. And or I'll hear, Jay, it's been three weeks, and you know this. X, Y, Z, no one accepted the offer and this, it doesn't feel like it's moving forward. And I've done, and they typically say so much work. And what they really mean is that they've spent more time than they thought they've needed to do, but they actually haven't done a lot of activity. This concept of I've spent 20 hours on this, I should be at my goal. I, I, what do you, what say you about that? Because I don't think it's not about the amount of time you spend. Yeah, no, it's about whether you've you've worked smart, not whether you work long. And so, if somebody says I've spent all these hours on it and I don't have anything to show for it, then they really need to sit down and maybe they need someone else to help them and figure out what they're doing wrong. Uh, they might be pursuing the wrong path. I mean, products that people aren't interested in. They might have the wrong marketing approach. They might have the wrong people work for them. I mean, these are all possibilities. And, um, you know, the, to to take the view that just because I put 50, 100, 200 hours in this, that it has to be successful is to un- misunderstand the whole nature of organizations and business. No one cares about how much time you put in. They care what the results are and whether they appeal to you. So you really, if it's not taking you up, then people have to really get brutally honest with themselves or help have somebody else help them get brutally honest as to what the problems are. But there's a, okay, but there's a big disconnect between how the typical, we'll say, person who's currently an employee is compensated typically to make the transition that you're talking about. Because oftentimes the compensation is not necessarily tied to producing a particular result as much as it is tied to how much time you you, you sat in the chair or in front of the computer. Well, I think you got to talk about uh, at least two different groups. So you have people who do just... uh, sort of commoditized work that's regular and, you know, there's not a lot of imagination and creativity. So those people should be paid by the hour. But when I'm dealing with professionals and knowledge economy people, which I tend to deal with a lot, I try to keep their base salaries as low as possible and have as big bonus potential as possible. And those bonus potentials are tied to these success metrics. So that's what you really want to do. Got it, got it. Now, when you say knowledge economy, there might be a few people who are not familiar with that that phrase or term. What do you mean? Well, I mean people for whom uh, the what their what their product is depends on their ideas, their 
their ability to convince other people. Uh, it's not just putting together, uh, you know, in an assembly line, putting together two different parts of a motor. So, uh, a, you know, we examples include journalists. You know, what you're what you're being paid for is how well mm. you convey your ideas and how well you organize them and how whether you come up with new ones or being a professor or being an accountant or being a lawyer or being a consultant or being an entrepreneur. What you're being compensated for is not just taking the basic steps and doing things that are standard. What you're being compensated for is coming up with something new, coming up with something mm-hmm. great, coming up with some uh, uh, new approach to analyzing something. That's what you're really being paid for. And more and more people who are college educated, that's what they're that's the types of jobs they want. And that's the types of jobs they're going into. And as we see, you know, robots are taking over some more and more of the commoditized work. So we got to distinguish those two groups. And, you know, when I was running Fidelity, we had portfolio managers running 10 billion, 20 billion, 30 billion. I tried to keep their base salaries as low as possible. Uh, They weren't starving, I can assure you. But (laughs) then we had metrics that we agreed with. You know, how well did they do? And same thing if you're you're running a software development company. I mean, the key is how well that software is developed, how quick it does, does it serve client needs. So to pay people based on just the number of hours uh, isn't really responsive. To what you're trying to get to, and uh, that's why you need to uh, have uh, success metrics. Now, if you just say to people, "Look, here we have a low base salary, and if you do a good job, we'll give you more," then it becomes very subjective, and people feel they don't get the bonus. You don't like them; it's very unfair, etc. But if you have success metrics that the group has bought into, in fact, they've helped develop them, then it's a very different story. Totally understood. Totally understood. Well. I know for those that have listened this far, they probably want to pick up more information, maybe even pick up a copy of your book, connect with you. But let me ask you this. What would uh, what would be the best way for them to to take their next step with you in some way, shape or form? They can go on. They can go on Amazon and easily pick up the book. It's quite inexpensive. I think uh, the uh, the versions go between 13 and 16 dollars. It's very short short and uh, also I've written a lot of articles on this stuff and we talk about I talk about things like how to read effectively how to write effectively and one thing that we probably should be talking about is meetings because I was going to say that was the third thing beyond uh, uh, procrastination and emails is meetings a lot of people I know spend most of their life in meetings and they don't think get stuff done because they're always at a meeting you know and that's really a big problem (laughs) <laughs> totally understood. Totally understood. Well, uh, I, 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 I have a, I guess, if you will, a final question for you, if you will. Um, let's pretend for a moment that someone listening is standing in front of what I would call the superhero outfit store. They think they want to become this entrepreneur. They're ready to make this change, get their business started, grow their business from seven to eight figures, six to seven figures, whatever it is, they think they're ready for it. And they're standing in front of the store think, trying to get prepared to make this leap. However, in the back of their mind, they have, you know, that voice, that voice that comes up and, and tells us what we can't do, why we can't do it, who are we to think we could do it. And for some people, they're even related to that voice. So my question to you, because I think your answer is going to be awesome. My question to you is if you knew that they were actually going to do what you suggested in the next, say, 24 to 48 hours, what would you suggest that they do? Well, I believe that they ought to begin by formulating their business plan as to how to grow their business or expand it or whatever they want. But then they need to set up a process to feedback and revise that uh, Hmm. plan. So the first thing they ought to do is go to people who are experts in their area and ask them what they think about the plan, whether they think it will fly. And if not, what do they think are the strong points and the weak points? And then they ought to set up, you know, whether you call it a beta test or this sort of thing, they ought to try it out. They ought to try out 
well, if this is the critical path for the expansion, let's try this out now with a small group of people and see whether they really are enthused about it. And if they're not, let's understand it why. Or if this is some new type of software system, let's talk to the people who are going to use it and see if you had this, is it really going to do it? So what the way to overcome that voice within you is not to feel like you have to have it all done at once, but to start off with your business plan, get feedback from as many people as you can who are knowledgeable, and then try out various elements of it to see whether they work and be flexible so that you can change things uh, if you're getting feedback that says this isn't working or that isn't working. So we're back to this is an iterative process, a number of steps, and your expectation isn't that you're going to hit the jackpot right away in 24 hours. Your expectation is that you're going to set up these steps and figure out whether or not what you're doing is really going to be successful. Absolutely appreciate that. I, I just want to be one of the first to say thank you for doing what it is that you're doing and helping all of us entrepreneurs, et cetera, get more out of our days. Because again, time is one of our most precious assets and you're, you're helping us utilize it in a more efficient and productive manner. And I thank you for your knowledge, insight, and wisdom here with and sharing it here with us today at the Cashflow Diary, sir. Well, it's great being with you, Jay. Uh, I appreciate your attitude and uh, it's a lot of fun. You have good questions and it's been uh, been fun for me and I'm sure it's fun for your audience. All right, ladies and gentlemen, you know what time it is. It's time for you to move at the speed of instruction. Well, what does that mean right now? Well, it probably means there's a book you need to go pick up because you know, like I know, you've said some of the things you heard me say, right? You've said that this is finally going to happen for me. You know that the days have gotten away from you. You know you spend way too much time in meetings or your email. So go pick it up, extreme productivity, boost your results, reduce your hours, because if nothing else, you'll get more done and likely, finally, invest more time with your family where it really counts. It's been fun talking to you guys today. I look forward to talking to you soon. Until next time.